How's it going, everybody? This is Josh. He's the founder and the brains behind all these DVDs. And this is Trip. He's the hand model behind all these DVDs. And with this DVD, we got a special offer for y'all. Special offer. After every 100 DVDs we sell, we will be giving away this valve spring compressor kit. And after every 500 DVDs sold, we will be giving away a rebuild S13 or S14 head of your choice. There again, after every 100 videos, 100, 200, 300, 400, we will be giving away a valve spring compressor kit. And then after every 500, we'll be giving away a completely rebuilt S13 or S14 head. Josh, you have anything else to say? Well, with that being said, thank y'all very much, and we hope y'all enjoy this DVD. Thank you. What we have here is a 96 S14K24DE head here. We're going to start removing the lifters and the shims. The shims are stuck on top of the lifters with oil. Take a magnet at one and pull them up. The shim might come off the lifter. If not, just leave it on because you don't need to take it off. We're going to keep everything together as we take it off and keep it in order. Okay, we're going to reenact a stuck lifter for you. This one's actually not stuck, but we're going to show you what to do if yours is stuck. You want to take some uh, WD-40 or PU Blaster, whatever you have, and spray it around the edge of the lifter so it goes down the wall of it. Just a little bit will be fine. And then you want to take a small screwdriver and a hammer if you need to, and there's a little notch on the lifter, on each side of the lifter, and you're just going to tap it and spin it around just to get the lube lubed all the way around the whole surface. Don't kill it, just be real easy with it all. Like I said before, this one is not stuck, so we're just reenacting it for you. Yours will probably be a little harder to hit. But be very gentle with it. You don't want to damage it. You just want to distribute it around like that. Then you want to take a 21 millimeter socket and put an extension on it. And then take a rubber mallet. And you just want to lightly tap on top of it, but you want to compress the spring. You want to, you want to move the lifter up and down just to break it free from whatever trash is in there. And then once it finally comes free, you'll be able to take the magnetic wand and pull it out. If yours is stuck, the magnetic wand will not pull it out. You want to keep doing this till you get it. It will come off this way. We're going to show you two methods to remove the springs, the retainers, and the cotters. First method, we're going to use a spring compressor tool. First of all, you want to take a rolled up paper towel and put it underneath the valve that you're removing. Just pick the head up and stick it underneath the valve that you're removing. This is our valve spring compressor tool that we're going to use. There's many different ones to use. This is the one we have, so we're going to use it. It basically grabs onto the head and uh, compresses the spring down. You adjust the piston there to the height you need. We'll go ahead and show you how to do that now. The arms grab onto the bolt hole locations on the head. On this actual tool here, one arm is longer than the other. The longer of the arms go on the opposite side of the valve. So we're taking off the valve on the left, the arm will be on the right side. You want to do this so it positions the piston on the compression tool in the center of the valve. And you might have to press it down a little bit to get it on if you've already got it adjusted. Because as soon as you remove the cotters off there, the spring's going to want to come up. It's going to be harder to take off. After you have it installed and lined up and everything, you can go ahead and compress the spring. Just pull the arm down on your compressor tool. Try and keep the piston in the center of the retainer there. And what you're going to want to take off now is the cotters, which is the copper pieces there. Take a magnet wand and get those off. There's two of them, one on each side. If one gets stuck and one not come off, you can wiggle the compressor tool around to move it around because sometimes the oil will stick it on there and it won't want to come off. But you can also compress the spring even more if it's not down enough. We're going to decompress the spring. Like I said before, the spring's going to want to come up now, so it's going to be harder to get the tool off, so you might have to press down on the tool to get the arms off the head. Now we'll take our magnetic wand and remove the retainer. And we'll, then we'll remove the spring. But, yeah. Next will be your spring seat. It's basically like a washer down there. Just use your magnetic wand and pick it up. 
that's what the spring sits on so it doesn't damage the aluminum head. Okay, next we're going to remove the valve. You just want to turn the head over. And then press on the valve on top to push it down. And then pull it straight out. That's how you remove the valve. And you go ahead and remove the rag as well. Next, the little black thing there in the center is your valve oil seal. We're going to remove that. This is a set of valve seal pliers. A lot of people use deal nose pliers, but these work better because they don't really damage things as much. They have teeth on the inside which grabs the seal. So basically all you do is grab the seal and twist it and wiggle it while pulling up on it. They usually come out pretty easily. You might get one that's stuck. Just take your time. They will come out. Just twist them and wiggle them while pulling up on them. They should come out fairly easy. Just like that. And that's what your valve oil seal looks like. You can never reuse these. As soon as you pull them out, they're pretty much trash. So you definitely replace these. And then last on your head there is your valve guide. Where in this video, we're not going to actually show you how to remove that because I would highly recommend getting the shop to do that when you get your machine work done because there's a lot involved in taking those out. You got to heat the motor up to a certain temperature and pull it out with a tool. So you're best off just letting the machine shop deal with that. Here's a set of cotters. As you see, they're tapered. That's what holds the retainer on the spring. We'll show you how it works. We'll go ahead and take the valve and the spring and the retainer and put it all together. Now we have the valve, and you see on the valve, the end of it, on the tip, there's a little cutout. That's what the cotters actually grab onto. So we go ahead and put it all together now. You got the spring seat, the spring, and the retainer there. And you go ahead and just take the cotters and stick them on the cutout there of the valve with the uh, thickest part on top and the thinner part on the bottom. And then pull the spring up and the retainer and everything. Now you see that's what locks them on. Because the force of the spring pressing up on the retainer pushes up on the cotters and won't let them come off that cutout. And that's basically how it works. It's a pretty simple design. Okay, what we're going to do is we're going to keep everything in a baggie. Our shims are labeled E1 through 8 and I1 through 8. So as long as you got that lifter in the bag with all your valves and springs and everything, that should help you keep track of everything. So we can put everything in a baggie. You could label the baggie too if you like. For the rest of the 15 valves, you'll do it the exact same way we just showed you. But another alternative method, instead of the spring compressor, is using a hammer, a 19 millimeter socket, and a small extension. What we're going to do is remove the lifter with the magnet one. Again, the shim might come off, but it's okay. If it does, stick it back on there. Then you're going to take your 19 millimeter socket with an extension. We have a deep wheel, but a regular standard size socket will work. Just stick it over the top of the valve, and then you're going to hit it with a hammer. You know the cotters are going to come out because your retainer will come up when you hit it with a hammer. So we'll go ahead and do that now. See how the retainer came up? The cotters came out. So go ahead and remove the socket and get the retainers and the cotters and everything off. You got two cotters and a retainer on top. And then take your spring off. Then remove your valve spring seat off the bottom. We actually did not use the rag on that one, but in most cases you'll need to put a rag under there because the valve will come down and will not release the cotters in some cases. But in this case ours worked fine without the rag, but I would recommend using the rag. So now you want to press on top of the valve there, as you see in just press right there when you flip the head over and the valve will come out. So flip the head over, press right there where I showed you, and the valve comes down, and then pull it out. And then we'll use the oil seal pliers again to remove the valve oil seal. Again, just grab a hold of it and wiggle it and twist it while pulling up on it, and it'll come out. It shouldn't be very hard to get out at all. Just make note that you will still need a spring compressor to install your valve train.
this valve here is actually sticking on ours. I'm assuming it's grabbing onto the uh, the oil seal, but it's perfectly fine. Let's go ahead and pull it out, and then we'll pull the oil seal out. As you can see here, the valve is is fine visually. Another thing to note, the intake valve is larger than the exhaust valve, showing you here in the video. As long as you keep everything in the bag and keep track of everything, you shouldn't have to worry about that. Now that we have everything removed, another thing I want to note is if you have a head that's already been resurfaced on the bottom, you want to put it on a rubber mat because you don't want to scratch or damage it in any way. But since this one has not had any machine work or anything yet, we're just going to use some blue rags on a plastic table. Everything will be just fine. If you do use the hammer and socket method, be very careful not to damage the head. You can see right here, I accidentally hit the head with the hammer there and bent it down. So be very careful if you use that method. Like I stated before, this is a 96 head. As far as the difference in the heads between S13 and S14 in the years is on the 91 through 94 heads, this bolt for the valve cover is not here. It's actually right here. So that's one way you can tell it's an S13 head versus an S14 head. The 97 and 98 S14 heads do not have the last cam holders here where the 91 through 95s do. Well, like I said before, this is a 96 head. This head will look exactly like a 95 head. And the only difference between the 95 and 96 head versus the 91 through 94 is that bolt hole location will be right here. And there'll not be one here. And for the 97, 98, they will not have these cam holders back here in the back. That's the best way to tell the difference between the heads. Okay, we're going to extract the stud out of the head here. It's broken off. I have some Craftsman drill out extractors. This stud here is actually an M10, but we're going to use an M8 because the M10 is just a little too big. I don't want to drill through the threads of the uh, head. Because you don't want to drill too big because you don't want to drill through the threads of the head. You just want to get the stud out. You don't want to damage the head. So, what you got to do is you got to install your extractor into your drill, put your drill in reverse. And uh, this little part right here actually slides back a little bit away from the drill bit because the drill bit's on the end there. First thing you want to do is punch a hole right in the center of the stud there. If you don't have a punch, you can use a Phillips head screwdriver. Put it right in the center and hit it with a hammer. Now I'll go ahead and start trying to drill. You definitely want to make sure it's in the center because you don't want to mess up your threads in there. So if it doesn't start drilling the center, go back and punch the hole better. Drill slowly.
After you get your hole drilled down enough, take your extractor out, and you want to get the threaded part all the way down to the drill bit so it can start extracting the bolt out as you go down. And when I get down so far, then I'll stop. Get it installed back in the drill. And you want to keep going slow with it. You don't want to burn your bit up. You want to make sure you're drilling in the stud and not through the head. You definitely want to have your drill at a slow speed setting. Because when it gets to this point right here, it's going to lock onto the stud. It's going to try to reverse it out. This one here is not going to come out. Since we couldn't get our stud out, we're going to use a smaller extractor. We're using an M6 now. And we're going to go ahead and drill in the center of the hole that we were drilling before. Again, you want to go very slow with it. You want to put pressure down on it. Like I said before, you'll drill down enough to get your drill bit down enough, and then you'll pull it out, and you'll turn the extractor down so that it will extract the bolt. But the main thing right now is make sure you're drilling straight so you don't drill into the threads. You don't want to mess up the threads on your head. Or else you have to retap it. We're going to take our extractor and turn it down to the drill bit. And it should go down far enough to where it will start extracting the bolt out. If it does, start extracting it out, I would stop with the drill and I would hand turn the drill to turn the stud out because it could possibly pull the extractor out with the drill. As you can see it's drilling down. The extractor will eventually get to the point where it grabs the stud. Well, that's good. Our extractor broke off in the drill, but it's actually still in the stud, so we're going to try and turn it by hand. Just go very slow with it. You don't want to break loose that extractor, or we'll not get it back in. As you can see, the stud is coming out with it. And it's out. Okay, when you want to remove your exhaust stud, you want to shoot it with some WD-40. Let it sit for a little while. Okay, after it's been sitting for a while, you want to go ahead and, and go ahead and thread a nut on there. Thread down just enough to get another nut on there. We'll thread it down more. So basically, what you're going to do is you're going to tighten the two nuts together, and then the nut you're putting on right now is the one you're going to loosen the stud off with. Sometimes this method works and sometimes it doesn't. Depends on how bad the stud is stuck in the head. You might have to heat it up if it doesn't work.
And this one's coming off. Let's go ahead and thread it all the way off. Here's a list of things I recommend getting done at the machine shop. I recommend getting a hot tank and check for cracks. If it needs to be resurfaced, make sure you tell them to resurface it one thousandths of an inch at a time, which is .001 inch, because your limit is only eight thousandths of an inch, and that includes the block. I recommend getting a three angle valve job. You can pay more money and get a five angle if you like. I highly recommend you getting them to compression test the head after they do the valve job. Okay, after we have the head back from the machine shop, we're going to go ahead and check the levelness of it that they surfaced. Again, you want to use something that you know is truly straight. We're just going to use this uh, straight edge ruler here. And standard is 0.0012 inch and limit is 0.004 inch. We're using a 4 thousandths feeler gauge. Check levelness. You want to check at all corners of the head. And if filler gauge goes underneath the ruler anywhere, you'll have to get the uh, head resurfaced again. And also, limit on resurfacing the head is eight thousandths of an inch, but that includes the block. So if you get the block surfaced down four thousandths of an inch, you only have four thousandths of an inch to surface off the head, because you can only have a total of eight thousandths of an inch resurfacing limit on the block and the head combined. And we are good. Okay, now we got our head back from the machine shop. We're gonna check the head height. A normal head should be measuring 4.972 to 4.980 inch with a limit of eight thousandths of an inch. We actually got seven thousandths of an inch service off this head because it was warped pretty bad. So we're getting measured now. We're gonna measure from the uh, top to the bottom. And you want to measure all the way around the head just to make sure everything's true. And then you'll take your measurements that you're getting from the head here and you'll minus it from what a normal head should measure at and that'll give you your difference and that's how much they surfaced off of it. And again, you have eight thousandths of an inch limit, but that includes the block as well. So since we had seven thousandths shaved off this one, we only have one thousandths of an inch to shave off the block or we'll be out of spec. When you go to get your head resurfaced at the machine shop, make sure you take the front cover with it and the bolt so they can bolt it to the head and get it surfaced with the head so it'll be level with it. Because if you're using a metal head gasket, you're going to have some issues with that lip there if, you're not, if you don't get it surfaced. It'll not be so important with a uh, stock gasket, but I would still get it done just to be safe. Also another thing to think about, if you're using a metal head gasket and you have to get your head surfaced down too much, like we had this head surfaced down seven thousandths of an inch, to get it straight because it, it was warped real bad because it had a blown head gasket. If you go too far and you're out of limit, they make multi-layered different thickness head gaskets that you can use. So you could actually make up the difference with a head gasket if you have to. Okay, we have all of our shims removed and they're all labeled E1 through 8 and I1 through 8. We're gonna measure them all and put them on our log sheet. If you wanna use the log sheet we're using, you can download it from my website. Basically what you're gonna do is you're gonna measure in the center of the shim with a caliber one measurement will be fine because basically you have the cam hitting the top of that and that's sitting on top of the lifter. So one measurement in the center will be good. We'll go to measure them all now and log them on our sheet. Make sure everything's clean. Wipe everything off. What we're doing now is we're measuring this for our future valve lash check. So when we go to measure the valve lash, we'll know exactly what the shim measures at. 
makes things a lot easier. Go ahead and do it now. And a half. Okay, and put a half. Okay, now we're going to install our valve train. We're going to start off with installing the valves. Make sure you install the valve in the corresponding spot where they did the valve job. And make sure you do not get them mixed up or your valves will not seat properly. We'll go ahead and install the valves now. You definitely want to lube the valve stem while you install it into the valve guide. So you get proper oiling at startup. We're just dipping a little bit on the end there. Okay, when you want to install it into the guide, you want to stick the valve in there and spin it while you're putting it in. So it lubricates the guide very well. We got a three angle valve job on this head. Just take them and spin them while they go down. That just distributes the oil all the way through the guide, which you will need at startup. They should go in fairly easy. They should not have much resistance on them at all. But at the same time, they should not be wobbly at all either. There's about one thousandths of an inch clearance between the valve stem and the guide.
also take note the intake valve is larger than the exhaust valve. Okay, we're going to flip the head over now. You want to be careful because the valves are going to want to come out. We're going to take the plastic that our head gasket come in. And he's going to hold it tight over it while we flip it over just so the valves don't fall out because you don't want to damage anything. With the lube in there, I mean, they could definitely still stick and not fall out, but you want to be careful in every way possible. Now we're going to remove the plastic out from underneath. Here, I'm going to pick it up and you pull it out. Okay, now we're going to install the valve oil seal. You need to lube it up. Just put a little on the inside so it slides over the valve guide easier. And right on the tip there where it's going to be touching the valve. Because the valve is basically moving on the inside there, up and down. That's where you need most of your lube for your startup. And then we're going to use a 11 millimeter deep well six point socket. A 12 point socket will not work. So we'll go ahead and stick it on the socket now. It just barely sticks on there, so don't try to force it on real hard or anything. And then slide it over the valve and down to the guide and just get it started on by hand and then we'll tap it on with a hammer. And then when you get it started on there and you're making sure it's straight, tap it on very lightly. When it bottoms out, it'll feel solid and it'll sound solid. And you'll know it's installed. If you come in from the front of the head here, you can look through the hole there and see the, the valve oil seal. You see that it's not down all the way. It does not go down all the way. We'll move over to this side. You can see the guide through the hole. On the guide there, you have a sealing cut. And basically, the oil seal goes over that and stops. And that's what seals it up. So. Just to, just to note that for you, the valve oil seal does not go all the way down. Okay, now we're just going to install the rest of the oil seals. Same procedure.
Okay, since we had a problem with some of the seals not sticking to the 11 millimeter six point socket, we uh, pushed them on by hand, which I mean, you could do it that way too, it works just fine. You just sit over the top of the valve and just press it down. You push it down until it's close. They also make a tool to install the oil seals if you want to spend the money to get one of those. Okay, we have the valve spring here. You see the paint on the bottom? That is actually the bottom of the spring, but I would not go by that just in case something goes wrong or somebody painted it wrong. There's a narrow pitch on the bottom where you see the spring sits on the bottom of the spring right there for that distance. If we turn it around and show the top side, it does not go that far. That is what you need to be looking for. It's called a narrow pitch. And that goes down on the bottom, onto the head, down. The narrow pitch does. We're looting the top and the bottom of the spring seat here. Because the spring will turn around over time, moving up and down. You know, wear it onto the parts. If you don't have any kind of lube on it, it could wear down. As far as the seat, it goes all the way down to the bottom. And we're going to lube the bottom and the top of the spring because it has, that's where it touches the spring seat and the retainer. So we're going to make sure we get those lubed up good. You can even take a cup of oil and dip all these parts in, in the cup of oil if you want. And the narrow pitch pointing down, put the spring in. We're going to load up the retainer. Okay, we're going to go ahead and just install the rest of the valve train. Same procedure on every one of them.
Okay, we got a new valve spring compressor tool. So we're gonna install it on the head now. This one is a lot better than the one we was using before. We're gonna use the cam caps to hold it down. Basically, there's one side of the cam cap. You just gotta screw that one down. You ain't gotta worry about that one. It's just used as a spacer. Okay, now we're going to install the rod onto the brackets. We're going to go through the middle hole. It all depends on how you have your brackets set up on the head. The way ours is set up right now, we're going to go use the middle hole and we're doing the exhaust side. This side of the rod here has a hole in it and I actually drilled it out a little bit so it beveled it up there so it's not going to go through that way on ours. And this side that has anything, you can drill another hole if you want, but we're, we just use a rubber band on this side keep it from coming out because it will want to slide back out on you so it's not going anywhere now okay we're going to lift the head up and put a rag underneath the valve that we're working on again be very careful because the valves are going to want to come down you don't want to bend your valve what the rag does is it holds the valve up in place for when you go to press the spring down you can install the cotters on we're going to go ahead and install the cotters on top of the retainer just to get them in place. And we're going to put the tool on the bar and on the retainer. We have our tool set up this way. It may vary depending on your condition and what you're doing. You want to guide the cotters down with your finger around the valve. Try and get them to lock on. It's a bit of a task because that spring is hard to press down. But take your time and be patient. You will get to work. And this tool is a whole lot easier than the other tool we used before. Okay, now we're going to go ahead and install the rest of the valve train. We're going to move our rod over to the other side now. There's too much leverage right now. Like I said, this tool all depends on your situation and what you're doing and the angles you're going with as to where it's going to be set up, which will totally make sense to you when you actually go to do it. And this tool works great when you're replacing valve oil seals on the car while the motor's in the car.
One thing to note, if you have aftermarket springs and retainers and everything like that, it's going to be a lot harder to press them down than these stock springs because they're lots, the spring is a lot stiffer. So you definitely want to get some good leverage on that. And like I was doing, I was holding one side of the head for him. You definitely want to get somebody to help you do that because if not, the head could flip over possibly and that would be bad. If you don't have anyone to help you, you can use a device similar to this and just clamp it down to the table or whatever, like on an exhaust stud or on the side of the head or wherever you can grab a hold of it. You can even clamp it to the top of the head there. If you don't have anyone to help you, you can do that. Because those aftermarket springs are a lot stiffer than these stock ones and you will definitely be able to tell the difference and it's really hard to press them down. Another thing I want to add is we're using a rubber mat on our table this time because we have a head that has been resurfaced. I highly recommend using a rubber mat. Okay, we're going to install the lifters now. You want to cover the outside of them in assembly glue or oil or whatever you're using. And if you want to, before you have your valve train installed, you can install some assembly glue on the ID of the hole as well. But it's not really needed because you're putting on the lifter and it's going to slide down the hole and that's going to lube it. You don't need none on the inside of the lifter. And on top of the lifter, it's going to get lubed from the shim when we go to install those. So we're mainly concerned about the outside of the lifter right now. Okay, when you go to install the lifter, it's a pretty exact fit. So just let the, just let the lifter go in on its own. Do not force it at all. And again, make sure you're putting all the lifters back in the positions where they were when you removed them. And we didn't show you for this video, but if you're going to use New lifters, you definitely want to measure the ID of the hole and the OD of the new lifter to make sure it's going to have the right fit and have the right oil clearance in between them. Okay, now we're going to install the shims. I'm going to wipe them off, get them real clean, top and bottom, and then loop them up and install them. Doesn't matter which one's top is. You can tell the top because it's the shiny side, the mirror side, and the bottom is the dull side. And again, make sure you kept track of where they went because we've already measured them for your valve last check we're going to do later. Okay, what we have here is the stock K24D head gasket here from the Felpro kit. We're going to measure the ID of the cylinder hole to show you that it will be okay to use on a 20 over board block. It's 
stock is 89 millimeters and of course 20 over is 89.5 millimeters and what it comes out to be is 90 millimeters because as I'm sure you all know no one makes a stock gasket for an overboard block these are all right around 90 90 millimeters so we'll be good with that okay we're putting the head gasket on the block just to show you that it will fit this is a 20 overboard block so it's 89.5 millimeters where stock is 89 you can see there's no overhang and you still have a little bit of a lip so we will be good okay what we have here is Permatex copper spray gasket we're going to spray our head gasket with this and it's going to help it seal a lot better I highly recommend doing this on any OEM gasket You want to put light coats on it and go slow with it. You don't want to just stand in one spot and spray the crap out of it. You want to do the top and the bottom. Now just let it sit and dry. What we have here is a set of cams for S13. We have the intake and the exhaust cams. The exhaust cam for the S13 is a 248. The intake cam for S13 is a 240. The way to tell the difference between the two, the exhaust cam on the front where the dial pin is for the cam gear does not line up with number one cam load. Whereas on the intake, it does. That's the best way to tell the difference which now on the right we have an S14 exhaust cam which is actually the 232 the S14 intake cam is 232 as well we'll go ahead and uh, mic them out because there's there's actually a difference between the size of the loads okay what we have here is an S14 exhaust cam as far as the factory service manual states the exhaust and the intake cam loads are all the same size which is 1.6699 inch to 1.6774 inch and it has eight thousandths of an inch wear limit we're going to take a set of calibers and measure it this cam is a little dirty so it might be off a little bit it's like 1.676 is the biggest and the S14 intake cam should be measuring the exact same and you want to measure all your cam lobes this way and if any of the cam lobes is out of spec you need to replace the camshaft Okay, I'm going to show you the differences between the S14 intake cam and the exhaust cam. We'll go ahead and show you the intake cam first. As you can see right here, the notch in the gear is for where the dial pin is. It is lined up with number one cam loads. Now we have the S14 exhaust cam here. As you see, the dial pin is here, and the number one cam load is here, so it's not lined up. So that's one way you can tell the difference. Another way you can tell the difference is, okay, we have the S14 exhaust on the left, the S14 intake on the right. And as you'll notice, the oiling holes are set up different. Oiling holes right there is for the exhaust, and the oiling holes right there for the intake. So that's another way you can tell, because the oiling holes do not line up between the two, and our cam lobes are all lined up together. That is two ways you can tell the difference between the intake and the exhaust cam for the S14, 232 cams. Okay, what we have here is the S13 intake cam. As far as the factory service manual states, it needs to be 1.6699 to 1.6774 inch. We'll get measured now with the calibers. This cam is still dirty as well. Looks like 1.674 was our biggest reading, which is in, which is within range. The limit is eight thousandths of an inch. You want to check all your cam lobes this way, and if they're out of limit, you have to replace the camshaft. Okay, what we have here is the S13 exhaust cam. In fact, the service manual states it needs to be 1.6699 to 1.6931 inch. Looks like 
1.692 and a half. So we're within spec on this cam. Again, you want to measure all your cam loads this way. And if they're out of spec, you need to replace the camshaft. Okay, what we have here is a S14 exhaust cam on the right with the cam gear on it. And on the left, we have a S13 exhaust cam with no cam gear on it. Another way you can tell the difference between the two is the oiling holes on the cam. The S13, the oiling holes line up with the dowel pin on the end. Whereas on the S14, we'll remove the cam gear. And as you'll see, the dowel pin does not line up with the oiling holes on the S14 exhaust cam. So that's another way you can tell the difference. Here we have a S13 intake and exhaust cam gear. As you'll see, the dot and the cutout for the dowel pin are in the same spot, so it does not matter. Cam gears are exactly the same, so it doesn't matter which one you put on which. Okay, now we're going to lube up our cam journals to install our cams. Be generous with it. Okay, now we're going to lube up our cams. We're going to lube all the cam lobes and all the journals. Okay, now we're going to install our cam. This is the intake cam. Number one cam lobe will be pointing outward towards the intake manifold. Might have to turn it just a little bit to get it to sit down in the journals. Okay, now we're going to lube up our exhaust cam. We're going to lube all the lobes and all the journal surfaces. You want to get lube on all the moving parts for startup because you don't want metal on metal with no lube on it at startup. So be generous with all your lube. Okay, now we're going to install our exhaust cam. The number one cam lobe will be pointing outward towards the exhaust manifold. Again, you might have to turn a little bit just to get it laid down in the journals. Okay, now we're going to lube up all of our cam caps. We're going to lube them up and then just sit them on top of the cam in their corresponding spot. They all have a stamp on top of them, E1 through 8 for exhaust and I1 through 8 for intake, with an arrow pointing forward towards the front of the head. This will be the front of the head because your cam gear is on the front. Okay, now before we torque it, we're going to go ahead and hand thread them down, just to get them started. Don't try to tighten them at all, just get them started down. And you would do all the caps this way. Okay, the torque wrench that we're using is a Craftsman Micro Torque. It goes from 25 to 250 inch pounds. We clicked it back to 17. All these cam caps are in inch pounds, not foot pounds. So make sure you have a torque wrench that torques in inch pounds. We're going to start off with 17 inch pounds. 
And you want to go from the outside in, just like he's doing. And inch pounds is not much at all, so go really slow with it and be real easy with it. The back of the cans is jacked up a little bit, so it will take a little bit more to get them to come down. Just go real slow with it and be real easy with it. Because these bolts can strip very easily. We're on number four bolt right now. Now we're on number five bolt. You want to start on the outside and go to the inside on all the cam caps. This is going to be number one cam cap, two, three, four, five, and six. I don't know if you can see it in the video, but these cam caps are not going all the way down. They're not all the way flush yet. When we get done with this first torque on the intake cam, we're going to do the same thing on the exhaust cam, and then we'll move to step B. Because you want to torque the cams in two steps. First step being 17 inch pounds, and the second step being 79.9 to 104.2 inch pounds. Okay, now we're doing our first torque. We're going to start with our second torque, which factory service manual spec is 79.9 to 104.2 inch pounds. It basically, it, it lets you choose which one in that range. We're going to go with 96 inch pounds an hour. And you want to torque them in the same pattern that we just did. And again, go very slow and be very cautious with it. You can strip these bolts real easily.
Okay, after we have our cams installed, I pick the head up here to show you. Some of the valves are going to be open just a little bit because the chain's not installed yet. So just be warned of that. If you're not doing this on a rubber mat, you might want to put the head on something just so you don't damage any valves because we're doing ours on a rubber mat. We have our head propped up on a plastic case because we're going to do the valve lash and you're going to need to turn the cams and that's going to bring the valves down and you don't want to bend no valves or tear anything up. So we got the head cocked up like this just so we don't damage anything. And we got a towel in the plastic case so we don't scratch the head surface. Okay, we have our intake cam, number one and two cam load pointing straight up to do the valve blast check. And I just wanted to show you down here how far down the valves go. As you can see here, they will definitely hit if you don't have it cocked up like this. So make sure you have it sitting on something. The reason why we're going to check the valve lash on the head off of the motor is because I want to show you how to do it off the motor, just in case you ever need to do it. Because when you do it, it's a little bit of a different procedure because you have the timing chains installed on. But we'll go over that in the next video, part four of the motor build video. I just want to show you for the video how to do it now off the motor. Okay, now we're going to check the valve lash on number one intake side. The clearance you want to go for is 13 to 16 thousandths of an inch in between the cam lobe and the shim. So we're going to start off with a, a 10. And basically you want the filler gauge to go underneath the cam lobe and the shim. You don't want to force it. It should go very, it should go pretty easily under there. Since ours didn't fit, we're going to go smaller. We're going to try eight, eight thousandths of an inch. And it goes under. So we're going to log that down. Number one intake valve is eight thousandths of an inch valve lash. Okay, now we're going to check number two on the intake side. Starting with a 10, 10 thousandths feeler gauge, 0 0.010 inch. It goes in. We're going to try an 11, 0.011 inch. It does not go. So that one is 10 thousandths of an inch. And just to show you, we're using a 24 millimeter socket on the cam gear bolt. The lobe you wanted to check, you want it pointing straight up in the 12 o'clock position. And since we're done with these two, we're going to go to these two here. We want these pointing straight up. The cams are going to jump on you a little bit, so be careful with that. Again, make sure your head is at an angle so the valves do not smash on whatever it's sitting on. Okay, these are in 12 o'clock position. We'll go ahead and check these now, starting with a 10 thousandths feeler gauge. Ten goes. Eleven goes. Twelve goes. Fifteen goes. 16 does not go. So we have 15 thousandths valve lash clearance on this one. It's 0 0.015 inch. Okay, now we'll check number four. Same way, starting off with a 10 thousandths feeler gauge. The feeler gauge needs to slide in between the cam lobe and the shim without any force at all. If you have to press in it at all to get it to go, it is too big. You need to go to the next one down. See how his is sticking right there? It's a little too big. We're going to go with the next one down. So it will be a 15. Which will be 15 thousandths. And you want to log all these numbers down on your log sheets. And if you want to use any of the log sheets that we use, you can download them from our website. Okay, now we'll turn it again. We get these two pointing up. Now check a number five load. Start with a ten thousandths. I'm skipping around here. This one's ten thousandths. We'll start with number six.
This one's eleven thousandths. Do number seven. I have to flip the cam over. Now we'll check number seven. Ten does not go. This one is eight thousandths of an inch. Do number eight. This one's ten thousandths of an inch. Okay, now we're going to start on the exhaust side. Same procedure, starting with a 10 thousandths feeler gauge. I call it the 14 actually. This one's a 14 thousandths. We'll do number two. Twelve thousand. Do number That one's eight thousandths. Checking number four. Eight thousandths. Okay, now we're going to check number five. Have it zoomed in so you can see it a little better. That one's five thousandths of an inch. Okay, now we'll do number six. Eleven. Do number seven. No, it's a little tight though. No, that can't be tight at all. Eight, eight thousand. Do number eight. Seven thousandths. Now that we have our valve last check done, make sure you have your cams turned so your valves are not sticking down for when you go to store the head or sit it down on anything. Make sure you do not damage your valves. Okay, now we need to do some math, figure out what new shim size we're going to need. 
I made it my own equation because I'm on the factory service mail. I do not like the way it works. This one works better for me. And if you want to use any of these log sheets I have here, you can download them from my website. And as far as abbreviations, T is going to equal the target valve lash, which in our case, we're going to go for 14 thousandths of an inch, where factory service mail spec is 13 to 16 thousandths of an inch. So that's a little bit in the middle of that. N is going to equal the new shim size. O is going to equal the old shim size, and V is the old valve clearance. I've already done number one because I don't need to do anything here because 14 thousandths is my valve lash, so I don't need a new shim there, so I'm good to go with that one. So I'm going to do E number two with you to show you how it works. So first off, I need to get V, which is my old valve clearance. So I go over in my old sheet, or I wrote it down, is 0 0.012 inch. My target is 0 0.014 inch. So I'm going to minus the two. 0 0.014 minus 0 0.012 equals two thousandths of an inch. And then I need to write down my old shim size, which over here I have it, 0 0.089 inch. So I need to take 0 0.089 minus 0 0.002 equals 0 0.08 seven inch. So that is my new shim size I need there. Okay, now looking at the factory service man, we have different thickness shims that you can order. We're looking for a 0 .087 shim size. So if we look down the list, we have a 0 .0874, which our old valve lash was 12 thousandths of an inch, and we want 14 thousandths of an inch valve clearance. So the 12 thousandths of an inch is actually a thinner clearance but we're wanting a thicker one of 14, so we'll be safe going with the .0874 inch shim. We'll actually be over 14 thousandths just a little bit. It'll probably be like 14 thousandths and a half of valve lash, but that will be okay. Because again, spec is 13 to 16. You have that much leeway to get in between. You actually want to get as close as possible to your target valve lash on every single one of them for the best performance. But with this one, we're going to go with the .0874. So I'll write that down, .0874 inch. That is gonna be our new shim size. After we get our new shims and install them and everything and get the head on the motor and everything, we'll check our valve lash again just to make sure it is within specs. But that's the way you do the math on the equations that I have made up. Again, all you're doing is taking your old valve clearance, minusing it by your target valve clearance, whichever you choose it to be, and that's what you get after you minus the two. And then you're gonna take your old shim size and minus it by what you came up with here and that's going to give you your new shim size. And then you got to take that and go to the service manual and figure out what shim size they have closest to this, either thicker or thinner than this or dead on. And also for reference, the S13 intake valve lash is 12 to 15 thousandths of an inch. Okay, we have the car warmed up the normal operating temperature. We have the oil cap off. We're going to shoot the thermometer at the uh, shim to see where it is hot. Showing about 126. We're going to measure the shim cold. Point zero eight eight inch. Okay, now we're going to heat it up. Now we're going to take the shim and hold it with a pair of pliers. We're going to heat up to 126 degrees. Okay, it's kind of jumping around everywhere. So I'm, I keep seeing 124, so I'm going to go with that. We'll go ahead and measure it now. It's definitely heated up. Hold on a second. Same. Glare. 0 .088. After doing this test, we've concluded that heating the shim up does not change the thickness of it. Because we heat it up to about 125 I'd say 126 and it stayed the same thickness. I mean even though the the cam's going to heat up too, the lobe on the cam's going to heat up, it's not really going to change much at all. I mean if you want to go with that as far as do your valve last check, I wouldn't go no more than one thousandths of an inch, 0 .001, but personally I'm not even going to go one. I'm just going for 13 to 16 thousandths with the factory service manual specifies. Even though it says warm in the factory service manual, cold is going to be the exact same.
And the whole reason we did this, I noticed on the internet, a lot of people were asking what the difference in cold and hot was because in the factory service mail calls for hot. So that's really the reason why we did this test. Okay, we're gonna chase the threads on our bolt hole here. It is a M10 1.25 thread pitch. I'm gonna make sure you got it started straight and go slow with it. We just had a couple burrs on the beginning of our threads there. Go ahead and clean those off. It's good practice to chase all your bolt holes. Okay, now we're going to install our exhaust stud. There's two sides. The shorter side goes into the head. Just hand tighten it. When you go to install the exhaust manifold, and you torque the nut down, it'll torque the stud down as well. Just to recap, make sure before you take everything to the machine shop, you have all your specs and tolerances wrote down for them, just so they know not to go over. Like some old machine shops will start off at 10 thousandths of an inch resurfacing the head, where in this case, you'd be out of spec already because you only have eight thousandths between the head and the block. As far as these heads, you want to go at least one thousandths an inch at a time resurfacing it. So make sure you have your, all your specs wrote down and make sure they do not go over any of your specs. And also it would probably be good to go ahead and mark your cams, exhaust and intake. Just put an E and an I on each one of them for the machine shop just in case they get mixed up. On the next video, part four of the Motorville video, we'll be installing this head on this block and completing the long block assembly. We will also be having a giveaway on this DVD as well. If you need anything or have any questions, just send me an email and I'll help you out as best as I can.